it's hard not to listen to the news coming out of Syria these days without wondering when those who have had their lives disrupted by the Civil War will get a chance to start to heal. Thankfully, Syria has creative and inventive citizens, uh, one of which is our own Omar Soufan. Omar and his roommate Ibrahim have established a clinic in Lebanon designed to facilitate exactly that kind of healing. Not only that, they are also now using 3D printing technology. Uh, you can see it for yourself on display across the quad over in Retner Hall. It's very cool. 3D printing technology to create prosthetic limbs uh, for amputees in Syria. With that in mind, uh, please join me in welcoming, uh, from the class of 2017, Omar Soufan to the Mel Talk stage. Hi. Um, today I would like to share with you a personal story of mine. It's uh, not just my story, it's the story of hundreds of people. Um, five years ago, if you asked me where I would be today, my answer would definitely not be the stage. My answer would probably have been in an unmarked grave on the side of the road in my hometown. You see, you never really forget your first anything. The first time you lost hope, the first time you lost someone you care about, the first time you felt true freedom. See, I, like any other 16-year-old in my country, believed in the revolution. We saw it as a way to get out of the oppression that our parents faced for 40 years. And like any other 16-year-old, I remember myself standing in front of the window every Friday waiting for the day to come for me to participate in my first protest. I was anxious, but fear fearful as well. I say fearful because unlike the West, we're not faced by batons and shields, we're faced by live ammunition. And um, as a 16-year-old, that obviously is scary to me. And that day came, and I participated in my first ever protest. It was me and my cousins. And my, from that day forward, my life changed forever. You see, I grew up as an idealist in a country surrounded by injustice. The strong dropped to weak. Fortunately, I wasn't one of the weak, but I refused to do what the strong did. One of the hardest things about going out of these protests is the aftermath of it. Every day you would hear about someone dying. Muhammad, Obada, Salma, Fat. you just hear names. We saw these as martyrs. We used them as fuel to push forward towards what we wanted. But as time went by and casualties increased, we just couldn't keep up anymore. First, we were naming every protest after some of the martyrs' names. But after a while, that wasn't a possibility anymore. There were too many martyrs and not enough protests. As the year went by, I started noticing that what we were doing was the right thing, but we were doing it the wrong way. I firmly believe in what I'm doing. I believe that I can make a difference. But at the same time, I knew that what I was doing was wrong. I was willing to die for my cause, but at the same time, I didn't want to be a number. I valued human life. I saw myself as someone who can leave a positive impact on my community. And so two years passed by, I was done with high school, and I woke up one day and I realized I am not supposed to be here today if I really wanted to make any change. And that's when I decided I need to leave to the US. With no background whatsoever about what, what's waiting out for me in the West, I've never taken SATs or ACTs, I've never applied to any university before, I packed up my stuff, left my family, and went to Illinois. When I first went to Illinois, I signed up for a community college. I was a roommate with a Syrian refugee who rather became one of my closest friends. Distance really takes you away from your goals. My vision became blurry. I was way more focused on my job. I was more focused on providing for my family. I was more focused on my work that I forgot. However, that changed a year and a half later. I was allowed to go back. I say allowed because I wasn't permitted to go back. And when I go back, I didn't go through Syria. I went through a neighboring country, Lebanon, which houses one of the biggest refugee populations. While I was walking in the city, Beirut, uh, I started noticing these people on the street, lying, sleeping, families, kids. What shocked me was the reaction of these people. 
the locals towards these individuals. Um, I would see them walking over them as if they're stepping over a stone. They wouldn't even pay attention to them. Whenever I would try to approach one of them, they would shy away in fear as if I was trying to hit them. I tried to talk to multiple of them. Uh, at the end, I managed to get through to a woman and her baby. She was sitting uh, by a store and she was crying. After I asked her her name, I realized that she was from my country. And I had a conversation with her that changed my life forever. With that in mind, I went to Syria and I saw the huge difference over a course of a year and a half of what happened, the polarization that happened in my community. There were people, the strong became even stronger and the weak became even weaker. And I knew I needed something, I needed to do something to make a difference. I had one shot at this because what I was doing, getting involved in this on a large scale was considered as treason in my country and would get my family and my life in danger. So I had one shot at this. I needed to help someone who people thought could not be helped. So I thought to myself, I'm a Syrian refugee. I lost people I cared about. I had to move to a hostile country. I get abused by locals, but still that wasn't enough. I needed something harder. So I thought to myself, I'm a Syrian refugee who lost people I cared about, who got injured, lost their limb, or, got par or, or suffered paralysis, and now I'm in a hostile country. I'm abused by the locals and my own community. I'm looked at as a burden. And that is a person I can really help. That's when the idea came that I start a physical therapy clinic near the Syrian border. I traveled back to the US. It was my first year at UR as a transfer student. And I was excited. I went to my advisor. I talked to my friends. I even reached out to NGOs. I managed to get the contacts, and I got a plan. However, I needed the money. I got steered away towards uh, a grant. It's called the Davis Beach Grant that was offered by the school. With the help of my roommate, Ibrahim, I applied to the grant. Unfortunately, I did not get the funding, but that didn't stop us. We decided to go personal outreach. Um, uh, it was difficult because we had to keep it secretive because of the danger. It lurked towards my family's life. As months went by, we were almost there. We were almost hitting our goal. And uh, we were $1,000 away. However, it was time to start a clinic, and I made promises. I decided to go ahead, buy the equipment, and I'll go and figure it out later. I bought the equipment and went down there. Uh, while I was living there, I, lived where, uh, I stayed in a healing center that housed newly incoming refugees injured. And I shared with them food, water. I slept with them. I heard their stories, how they were injured, how they, what their future was, what they hoped their future to be. And their stories changed my life together, forever. I was still worried about that grant, but then an angel came, my mentor, Father Cool. He offered his help, and, and his gesture changed my life forever. He, man he managed to help cover the rest of the costs, and we managed to set up the clinic. Our first, our vision was to treat 15 patients a month within this small facility. Now, we treat up to 100 patients a month, and we treat Lebanese and Syrians at the same time. We created a place where both of them can come together and work together. However, we had another project on the back burner that we were thinking about, and that was prosthetics. While I was there the first time, I saw that most upper lip amputees had no prosthetics. That was because they were expensive, unfunctional, cosmetically unappealing, and expensive. And we thought, OK, let's reach out. So through Ibrahim's contacts, we got in touch with Enable, which is a for-profit uh, for within the US. We got and introduced our mentor, Adam Arabian, who later introduced us to a third NGO. Uh, who has a clinic like the vision we had, like the one we want to set up in Kenya. This guy, Paul Fothingham, agreed to go help with us treat the patients, fit and run training for the technicians that we were going to hire. We applied for the Davis, the Davis Peace Grant another time, and unfortunately we didn't get it again. Frustrated, we decided to go public, although that posed risk on my life and Ibrahim's, but that was the only way to do it. So we went public and we asked for donations through media outlets, through people back home, and we got the money through the support of our family and friends. By the time the clinic was about to start and everything was in set, Paul backs out a week before the project out of fear for his own life. So now I'm a week away from flying. I already have my ticket. I don't know what to do, and I go there. If that wasn't enough, I, when I arrived at the country, one printer was damaged beyond repair and the other one was stuck in customs. 
the project that we had for three weeks lost 20 days of bribes and uh, talking to officials to get the printer out of customs. A thousand dollars later, and we managed to get it out. I have a couple days left, and I don't know what to do. I bring the first patient, I do his interview. I sit down the technician, and I move the clinic to the, to the room I'm sleeping in. I'm printing day and night with the help of the technician. You see, we, to, uh, to some people, me, pe uh, people I think that was a, a failure of some sort, but I left there uh, feeling proud that at least I kept my promise. I, we did not stop working on the project. We didn't reach our goal, but we're going there. It might, might not be today, it might be tomorrow. One question I always get asked is, how can we help? Well, like any country that's war-torn, we're short on food, we're short on water, we're short on electricity, we're short on life. But what we're really short on, what people don't care, don't really, not care, not really know about, is hope. We're short on hope. If you take someone's hope away, you, you are killing him. If you feed someone for a day, and you feed him for a month, that's not gonna give him hope. What we want is for you to help us help ourselves, enable us to help our own. Give us farming land to get our own food. By setting up sustainable projects, we can reintegrate ourselves back to our own community. We, if we manage to take someone who society sees as a burden, who, who his own community has pushed him away and take him up a level, show him that he can have a future, maybe others can. I made a promise to myself a couple of years ago that I was gonna make a difference, and I'm gonna keep the promise with the help of the Rochester community, with the help of my friends, with the help of my family. Thank you. Let's hear it for Omar Sufan.